Hello, I'd just like today to uh, introduce Priscilla Finch and she is the Interpretations Officer for English Heritage for the South East and London. Today you've got the opportunity of asking the questions that I couldn't answer when we made our site visit to Portugal Castle as part of your GCSE. In particular, we're going to be focusing on King Richard II's palace and how you arrived at that interpretation. So I'm going to leave you with Cressida now, who will hopefully be able to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for asking me along. Um, the first thing to say is that the work of the, these interpretation panels and all our interpretation is done by a whole team. So working on the panels would be a historian, um, usually a properties curator as well, who knows the building really well, um, and also an artist. And the interpretation officer is just one part of the big picture. But what we do is we look at the audience, we look at who's going to be using the panel, we consider things like where it's going to be put, um, how long the text should be, and then we get information from all the historians and curators and we put it all together. I haven't been with English Heritage that long, so excuse me if I don't know the answers to absolutely everything. I've spoken to my colleagues who've um, worked on the site a lot longer, um, but I'll do my best to answer your questions. So who wants to start? Yes. Yes. How did you know what the kitchens and lower level was like? Well, that's from the, the archaeology of the site. You'll know when you walked in there um, that you were actually standing on that lower level because the um, great hall is on the first floor. So you're actually walking into the kitchens and the lower level. So we know the shape of those rooms from that archaeology. Things like the actual placing of the furniture, um, where we've got other images, other reconstructions of other places, will have drawn from there but otherwise I've had to use a certain amount of imagination to put the placings within the kitchen. But the shape, we know exactly. Um, how much artistic licence did you think you used? Well, again, it's essentially it's about using as much evidence as possible. So we won't, use, we won't put something in that's definitely wrong. What we might have to do is obscure things or not show things that we don't know about. So I brought some examples of other panels. Um, this is a good one. This is from Maiden Castle. Um, and as you can see here, there's a whole lot of cloud at the back. And the reason there's cloud is that we don't actually know all about the different patterns of the fields. But the kind of detail that we want to go into is not to guess things like that or use artistic license. So we've made it a rainy day and put that cloud there to cover the top of that so that we can only show things that we really know. Um, the things where we do use artistic license is thinking about the people and the, who will be in the building. But that's, again, that's about thinking about how it's going to engage with the audience. Um, how historically accurate is the clothing that the people are wearing? I mean, that's one thing that I couldn't find that much about, because most people I was talking to were the property curators. But we'll have talked to external experts to get the clothing as, as right as possible. As saying we don't guess anything, so we'll be as accurate as it possibly can be. Uh, when interpreting, do you ever feel like you're actually in the picture or if you're just there doing your job? I think if you feel like you're in the picture, something's going really, really right. That's what it should be about. But what it really should be about is making the people seeing the panel feel like they're in the picture. Um, with this, things like having, having the smoke, having lots of food, it's to try and get people to use their other senses and really think about what it's like being there. So if, yeah, if, if we're feeling like that, something's really working, but if the audience is feeling like they're in the picture, then we're really doing it right. Uh, what kind of foods would they have eaten at these banquets? Well, I've got a list here um, from a banquet that Henry V had, um, which was in... Uh, sorry. Um, it was a, this is a Christmas banquet, so it's a particularly special banquet. But obviously the banquet in the Reconstruction is quite a special banquet as well. And he had, for Christmas, he had dates, carp, um, roasted eels, isn't that nice? um, and a leech, which is like a boiled milk jelly. Um, and then for the sort of pudding, they had subtleties, which were edible sugar sculptures. Um, and they included St. Catherine, so I'm saying it's in sugar, and a tiger in sugar. And those kind of things would have been incredibly rare and special. That kind of refined sugar would be really, really rare. And so the kind of sugar rush that they'd have got from eating that would have been very different from them, the, the kind of food that they didn't usually have. So it would be very special things. It would be special things to show the wealth. And with a lot of emphasis on, on meat and fish, particularly local fish, that we maybe wouldn't eat as much now, like eels and lamprey, which is a kind of, sort of fish with a horrible sort of sucky face. 
Um, was it commonplace for a jester to be present at mealtimes? Um, definitely in these kind of court occasions, um, the evidence suggests that there would be jesters around. I mean, the, in our image, the, the king hasn't quite arrived, um, but in those kind of court things, the jester is often somebody that could speak directly to the king in a way that other people can. So the reason that's why they've put him towards the front of the scene, so he's quite near the king. Where would the smoke from the fire go as it's in the middle without a chimney? That's a really good question. So I talked to the properties curator, and he said that the accounts we've got of the building and the roof show that there's a sort of opening in the top of the roof. So there's a roof in the roof. Um, so I think it's a sort of slatted, slatted opening, obviously, otherwise rain would come in. Yeah, and I, when, you, when I saw that question, I looked at the picture again and thought, what is happening here? But that's, we know that from the accounts. Um, and we also know that there aren't any other paths or chimneys around the rest of the building. Um, so it definitely would have to be in the middle, because there definitely would be a, would be a fire, because this is it's quite a big stone building, but otherwise no heating, so there needs to be a fire in there somewhere. Um, do you have a generic image of what a castle looks like in your head, and often find yourself drawing this image in parts of it in your interpretations? We definitely try not to. Um, as I said, particularly with English heritage, because we're all about architectural history and safeguarding, um, the architecture of the country, we would try not to do anything generic. So anything in the images would have come from the archaeological evidence, from the documentary evidence, or from other castles. So to the extent that it's generic and castle-like, it's because it's drawn on other castles, but it shouldn't just be a, a straightforward imagination of a castle. Yeah. Um, is the fact that the people are eating peacock based on fact? Yes, no, that one is. I, I thought that was a brilliant question. Um, yes, they definitely had peacock. Um, there's a recipe from the 1430s showing you how to cook a peacock, um, something like this. And the, the wonderful thing, I think, is that what they would do is they would skin the peacock, they would cook it, and then they would put the skin back on the peacock. So that's why in this, in this drawing you've got the, the whole peacock. Um, and then the king would be sitting at the, the far end of the hall, the far end from the services, and the food would be processed out. And you'd really make a show of having something like a peacock. And you might even, the recipe suggests that you can gild the beak of it doesn't say what it tastes like. Uh, how do you know what the storage room is like? I mean, again, that's from the archaeology. So it's it, those rooms at the bottom are the ones that you walk into, so we know, we know the shapes, shapes of the rooms. Um, but yes, yeah, certain things will have to have been conjectured from other, other accounts and other places. Is it possible for you to know that the illustration that you've done is as accurate as it can be? As I said, we'll definitely try and base it on really detailed archaeology on the accounts. Um, and we'll try and make it as accurate as we think that it, we can now. But in 10 years' time, that panel will have got weather beaten or somebody will vandalised it. And if I'm still in post, I will change it. And at that point, I won't just reuse this image. I will go um, back to architectural historians and archaeologists and say, has there been more archaeology done at that site or other sites? Um, has there been more studies done that might give us a completely different view? So each time we, we re-look, so we think it's accurate now, but it may well be in 10 years' time that there'll be a different interpretation and we'll redo it then from that evidence. Yeah. Um, are there any accounts of what the interior will look like? Well, there aren't descriptions. What there is is there's a list of all the building materials um, which the, the king asked to be kept just to work out how much he spent on the whole building of the palace. So that lists things like the plaster in the walls, um, it lists things like the, what the materials were in the roof, and it also says things like there were 280 men working on it, and it cost um, £1,700, which is quite cheap, when you think of the whole palace. Um, but from that detail, it tells us that there's stained glass, so, so we know to put stained glass in our reconstruction. Um, what gave you the impression that the ceiling was as you portrayed it? Well, there's, there's a couple of things. Um, the cornice, some of the cornice exists on the building, so this part up here, so that we know that it, the ceiling rested on top of it. Um, and that gives us a sense of, of the shape of the ceiling. But then it's also taking it from other, um, other medieval halls um, and other illustrations. So it's, it's a combination of that archaeology of the building um, and other places. Yeah. What style of artist do you feel is best for an interpretation? Well, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, for something like um, this prehistoric site, we've used an artist who does quite sort of loose and flowing um, illustrations because 
um, we don't really know that much about it. So we don't want something too detailed. Um, but with something like this one, which is from Houghton House, we've used somebody who's, who's quite precise and measured, because we know exactly what the shape of the building's like. Um, he's not somebody who's as good at people, so we haven't asked for this site to be peopled. Um, but with so the site we've been studying, there obviously are lots of people, because the interpretation officer has felt that it's all about um, helping people empathise with the people on the site. So it, it really depends exactly what you want to do. It's very difficult doing these pictures. They're done in tremendous detail, um, and they'll go backwards and forwards. I've got some, yeah, particularly this one. Um, this is um, one of our sites. And we start, you can see the artist has started with a rough sketch, and they've come back and spoken to the property curator and the historian, and they've covered it with annotations about things like the pictures of the roofs and exactly where everything should be. Um, and they've, they've drawn it again. And this one, there's, there's a hut that they've decided it should be there. Um, and then the finished work is all painted in. And it can take three or four months to do one of these things. So they're, they're done in, in tremendous detail. Uh, so it needs to be somebody who's really patient and also is, is prepared to be told exactly how it has to be, exactly what colour, exactly what, what wall. So we don't want an artist who wants to do a lovely painting of the castle. They need to be very, very detailed and um, prepared to put up with us going backwards and forwards and arguing about the pictures of the roofs till it's exactly right. What kind of food would they eat at a royal feast or banquet? Um, I think I, this one came up before. I think yeah, I was talking about the lots of lots of meat and, and fish, um, and also yes, sort of special things like sugar sugar tigers and things like that. Um, what do you know about the kind of musical instruments that the minstrels were playing? I mean, again, there's something personally I don't know huge amounts about. Um, the, I would imagine that it's done from. Uh, from accounts of what people people used, and there are lots of illustrations in things like manuscripts of people playing music. music. Um, also, they're at the very back, so I imagine that they didn't do as much research on, on these. If they'd wanted to play them in great detail, they'd have had them in more detail and had them further forward. How would you have known the colour of the walls? Now that's an easy one, and that's because in that account that I mentioned, um, there's details of the actual plaster that they used. They used gypsum that came from Dorset, uh, which, is kind of, which is white, and they'd have burnt that on site to make the plaster of the wall, so we know that more exactly. Um, do you find it useful to look at previous interpretations from other artists, or do you think that knowing other people's interpretation limits your own creativity and prevents you thinking beyond their ideas? Mm, it's, it's difficult. I think that's something that the artist would have to decide whether it's going to limit them or not. Um, but as I said, it's, it's all based on that evidence. So you might look at an earlier reconstruction and work out how much of that still fits in with the evidence. But you wouldn't want to copy it because we'd be looking exactly at, at the detail that we have now. Uh, obviously, because of the time period, with little knowledge on the buildings, how, how are you able to visualise a picture in your head of what it's like? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, there's, there's not that much information, but when you look at that site, there's all sorts of clues. So things like the exact post holes around the building showing exactly how the floor worked. There's all those low walls showing the, um, the layout of the buildings underneath. And then we were so lucky to have those accounts showing exactly what materials are used. So all that really builds up a picture and it all comes together. The thing that, that does need visualising is exactly what's happening in there, the people in there. And that's, that's about thinking what will, will help people imagine what the building was like in use. Um, do you ever use paintings that were done at the present time to sort of understand what the interior would have looked like? If, I mean, if we had a really good painting of the, of the hall as it was, we would put that on the panel. Um, so if, if one existed, we definitely use that rather than our own reconstruction. So we're doing a reconstruction because that doesn't exist. Um, did you have to guess much of your interpretation? Well, I'm saying it's as much detail as possible comes from the sources. And it's, it's only where there's things like people that we'd be, we would be, not really guessing, but um, drawing from other evidence and working out what works best. Yeah. How did you decide on a seating plan for the dining halls and castles? And so that is drawn from a combination of the existing layout of the room, what we know from the archaeology, and also from evidence in, in documentation and drawings. Um, so we know that the, the king or most important person would be seated at the far end of the, the room, sort of away from the service area, away from the draft of the door, and it meant that they could process food up from the kitchen. 
um, he would have his most important um, sort of colleagues and part of his courts next to him. Um, the seating arrangement further down the hall we don't know as much about, so that's where a certain amount of artistic license has come in. Um, but there are things that we definitely know, like the fact that he would have had a, a proper chair and everybody else would be sitting on benches. Um, what social occasion do you think the people are gathering for? I mean, that's something where the, where the artist would have had to come up with, with something if we didn't have a particular steer. I don't think we do here. Um, I was looking at it and, and trying to imagine myself, and I think it might be a, a feast that Henry V is having, um, because we know that Richard II didn't use the, the palace, so he built it um, because he was taken prisoner. But Henry V used it um, and before he set off the Battle of Agincourt. Um, he left from here, so perhaps it's something like that. But that's from something that I've imagined looking at the picture, and what we hope is that our visitors looking at the picture will start to imagine things like that. Uh, how did you know where the minstrel's gallery was? I mean, that's, that's a combination of the evidence of the room and other sites, um, so that we know that the main door was down here, and we know that these kind of wooden screens um, would usually be built over the, the doors, though because it would, nothing survives. Um, so we know that there would be a screen down here, and then that's where the minstrel galleries tended to be in these kinds of sites. So we, we use the evidence from other sites for the top there. Yeah. Um, how do you know where the fire would have been located when it took the square from its remains? Yeah, I mean, this is something which is very interesting with the archaeology. Um, as you see from this square underneath, um, that's been deliberately put in there because that's Part of surviving part of the walls in the actual site um, and so the hearth would have been built up on the foundation of this because you wouldn't put a fire on the wooden floor so you would set the whole building on fire so there's an actual evidence of the bottom of the hearth underneath and the fire would rest on that and then as we said earlier there would be a loo for the smoke to come out and yes also there's, there's no evidence of any hearth around the sides of the building so we're sure that that's what that stone was about how would you have known in such minute detail what the tapestries were of? Well, that's where, if we look at the tapestries, they're fairly detailed, but they're not too detailed. If we'd known exactly what the tapestries were of, we would have asked an artist who was really detailed um, to draw in something really, really exact, and we'd have something really exact. They've done it fairly impressionistically, because we've got a sense of what they would be like, but we don't know exactly. And um, we'd draw these from art history. And these look to me very much like some um, tapestries that are at Stirling Castle. So I think they're probably based on those ones. Yeah. What records would you collect prior to painting to help you plan your interpretation? Well, the historian will be looking at everything they could possibly find, everything on Porchester Castle. Um, so we know that there's that account um, of Richard II for the building materials. That's in the National Archives in Kew. Um, but they'd also look at things like the archaeology reports. So there's lots of archaeology in the 1970s, and they would have written up really detailed reports. So they'll look at those. They look at any accounts um, of banquets held in the building, um, and they'll put those all together. Um, as well as those written accounts, obviously looking at the actual building. So the artist will go on site several times to look at it. Um, the interpretation officer will also talk about where they're going to put the panel, because you, if you're, if the visitors are coming in one end and they're looking at the image, you want to make sure that that matches up exactly with the view. So if the visitor route is coming out the other end, you do the picture exactly the other way around. So all those things come together to produce the image. Any other? Yeah. Uh, do you think that your interpretations of other castles affect your imagination and other illustrators' sort of imaginations of the castles that you've done? Um, as I say, it's, there's a lot about it's a lot about as much evidence as possible, um, and people will try and revisit them each time. Um, so they would try not to get too much of a sort of generic sense of the castle. Um, but there are certain similarities between different illustrations. Um, but you can see something like this. Um, this isn't a castle, it's a cloister, but they've done it in a much, much plainer style. Um, it's very, very different from this. So that again, that comes down to the people that you know will be looking at the panel and the artist and the historical evidence. So you'll draw those things together and you might come up with a very different, um, different response. Um, when you're drawing your interpretations and coming up with your ideas, do you discuss it with other panels and historians, or do you leave it completely down to your evidence and your imagination of what it looked like? Then, in particular, there's a lot of different people and a lot of different experts, 
and we would make sure that it was passed through everybody to see it. So it's, it's a really big group effort, because I was saying it's, it's three or four months' work. It's also got a lot of money to commission one of these things, so we wouldn't want to get it wrong. So we definitely talked to as many people as possible, um, share ideas, um, and yeah, bring it together as a team effort. But I think, I think that's it. If anybody wants to look at any of these other illustrations, because they show, if you look at them in more detail, you can see the different stages of bringing out the reconstruction. Please do. And the other thing I just wanted to say is that when people are visiting the site, it's not just about the panels. They'll also be looking at the exhibition in Borchester Castle, which gives you a sense of the history. Um, most visitors will also have an audio guide, um, which talks to you about the, the history of the site as well. And that's because different visitors have different sort of learning styles. We want people to be able to draw from, from different things and put together that, that picture of the castle. So it's not just about the panel. Um, so these reconstructions are a really good way of helping people visualise what's inside it. I'd just like to thank you, that was really informative, and uh, I'd like to thank Christina in our usual way, it's for more.